Well, don't you just love the phrase, when it rains, it pours? We can all relate to that phrase because all of us have had those seasons in our life. One bad thing happens, and then it's like an avalanche of everything that could go wrong goes wrong. You've been there. The dishwasher leaks. You get the water cleaned up. You back out of the garage to get to work, and your tire's flat. The dog has to take an emergency trip to the vet. You get to work. You get the phone call. Your, your son or daughter, they've got the stomach virus at school, and they need to be picked up. And one thing just leads to another, to another, to another, and all of a sudden the deck is stacked against you, and you're going, why is this happening to me? What's going on here? Well, Chelsea and I were just talking about this just a couple of nights ago. We, we had kind of one of those weeks last week. Um, her, her car was in the shop getting, getting some repairs. On the way home, my brake light turned on in the car. I needed new brakes on my vehicle. Just boom, boom. We get the call that a dear friend, like a second dad to me, had passed away, and we had to make our way to Florida for a funeral. On our way to the funeral, we got a call that another dear friend of ours in Kentucky had suddenly passed away. The next morning, we woke up when we were there. We got a text from our oldest two daughters, and they both had pink eye while visiting their grandparents in Nashville, Tennessee. And we're sitting there scratching our head. What else could go wrong? Well, Monday happened, and we got the rental car back over the weekend that we had taken to the funeral there in Florida. And Monday, I start getting a call. Mr. Slimp, your rental car is overdue. You're going to be charged a fine. We're coming to collect the car. If you don't get it back to us, immediate attention is needed. I spent most of my day Monday on the phone with Hertz Rent-A-Car to insure them with my receipt that indeed I had dropped the car off Saturday night as we had communicated in the rental agreement, only to realize at the end of Monday a new employee forgot to click one final button in the check-in process and the company thought we were taking the rental for a joyride through the weekend. When it rains, it pours. But amid the despair of, uh, of life, amid its challenges, amid its frustrations that suddenly show up when it rains, it pours, one thing can break through all of the clouds of calamity, and that is a refreshing word of encouragement. And this happened to me just this Monday. After going through all of that, I received an email from a dear church member talking about um, a, a wonderful testimony of what God had done in their family and a personal word of encouragement to me. And upon reading that email, that refreshing word of encouragement, it was like none of that stuff ever happened. Like all of the bad stuff that we were navigating and all of the frustrations and the anxiety that life storms can present us, it just went away because of a refreshing word of encouragement. And tonight, I want us to turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. And in 1 Thessalonians, Paul is going to give a refreshing word of encouragement to these young believers in Thessalonica. Now, the church in Thessalonica, they are real people. They were uh, facing real challenges. They were new believers. Paul had led them to the Lord. Paul had preached. Paul had started a church. They were fresh in their faith but they were under great opposition. You know, First and Second Thessalonians really is a very practical and relatable book to write where we are today. They were facing a lot of opposition, just like the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is facing in this day and hour. You know, we reread of how Paul came to Thessalonica in Dr. Luke's writing in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. We read of how they came and how they preached and the work that God began there in Thessalonica. We read how Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy, they first arrive in Philippi on their way to Thessalonica. They arrive in Philippi where they led Lydia and her household to the Lord Jesus Christ. They would be arrested in the Philippian jail. And remember Paul and Silas singing praises in the midnight hour. And the earthquake comes and the, all of the prisoners, they, they escape. But Paul and Silas are there and they lead the Philippian jailer and his family to the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is after this journey in Philippi that they launch out and move next to Thessalonica. 
And Paul declares the gospel and he preaches there. We read in Acts chapter 17 and verse 2 that Paul stayed there with them three Sabbath days. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that Paul was there only for three weeks. Um, it could have been a little bit longer. We do know that he preached three Sabbath days according to Acts 17 verse 2. But he could have stayed a little bit longer. We, we don't know. We know that he was there long enough to make some tents to provide a source of income for himself. He received a love offering for the church at Thessalonica. But we do know whether it was three weeks or a little bit longer, it was a short time because no sooner that they had gotten the church started and people coming to the Lord Jesus Christ that opposition and persecution came against Paul and the mission team and they had to leave. They, uh, they left heading to Berea. And how, however, the Jews from Thessalonica, they followed them to Berea and they would leave from there from Athens and then on to Corinth. And it is in Corinth where Paul is writing this letter of 1 Thessalonians. You see, he wanted to encourage these new believers in Thessalonica. He wanted to encourage them and assure them of his love and support and his concern for them. He also wanted to take a moment to share some doctrinal truth to go deeper in the truth of God's Word, to help disciple them, to help guard them from confusion, and to strengthen them amid the persecution that they would have to endure. But here in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, amid all they were dealing with, their new faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a new church, Paul wanted to give them a refreshing report. A refreshing report. And that's where we want to begin tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 2 through 10 as we think on this refreshing report. Verse number 2 reads, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing Beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia, and Achaia, who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. A refreshing report. First tonight, I want us to notice that these Thessalonian believers, they were setting a good example. They were setting a good example. In verse number four, Paul calls these believers beloved brethren. And this is indicating that Paul had great joy in his heart and gratitude for these Christians because of who they were in the Lord Jesus Christ. They had been saved. They had been saved. And this salvation just wasn't in word only. These believers had truly been changed by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the work of salvation isn't just a verbal proclamation. Rather, it is to see God's work of grace changing a person's life. Salvation isn't something said. Salvation is something seen. When God's grace gets a hold of our hearts and lives and we are truly saved, a life change, a behavior change happens. You see, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You can't work to make yourself saved. It is by grace, through faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. But when we have truly been saved, there is a change of behavior that God's grace does on the inside of us that works itself on the outside of the believer. You see, the work of salvation simply, it changes our lives. 
Everything becomes new. The old life is gone. We see a beautiful picture of this when we compare 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 with verses 9 and 10 of the same chapter. And I'm going to put these up individually on the screen tonight so we can see. First off, Paul outlines in verse number 3, we see, he says, your work of faith. Your work of faith. And then in verse number 9, he says, you turn to God from idols. You see the work of faith in their life. We see it when they turned from their idols to the one true and living God. But next in verse 3, Paul mentions their labor of love. Your labor of love. What is that? Well, we see that in verse 9. To serve the living and true God. And then also in verse 3, Paul references and patience of hope. Patience of hope. And in verse 10, we read what that is. To wait for his son from heaven. That is the Lord Jesus. They were patient and they were hopeful for the return of Christ. And so he is setting up for us this beautiful picture between verse 3 and verse 9 and 10 of how this salvation had really changed their life. But in this refreshing report that Paul's giving us, he's saying, hey, you're setting a good example. Well, how were they setting a good example? Paul reflects that they had received the word. They had received the word. In verse number 5, Paul writes, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. You see, Paul... And, uh, and his missionary friends did not come to Thessalonica to make money, to scheme them out of anything, to sign them up for some kind of religious program. They came declaring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They preached the word of God. And the Holy Spirit of God moved in great power. This was not their own speech. This was not a self-help talk. This was not a motivational speech. They were preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God moved in Thessalonica and they received the gospel message. They were eager for the Word of God. They had accepted the Word of God. They received the Word. But they also followed their spiritual leaders. In the first part of verse 6, Paul writes, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. You became followers of us and of the Lord. And the word follower here that Paul uses is the word of imitate. They were imitators. They just didn't accept the message, but they accepted the messengers. They adopted the behavior and imitated what they saw in Paul and Silas and Timothy, they imitated it in their own life. You know, just as babies and young children need parents and grandparents to nurture them, to guide them, to help them grow and develop, to teach them what to do, how to walk, how to talk, how to eat properly. So young Christians need older believers, more spiritually mature believers to help nurture them love them, disciple them, guide them in their spiritual journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, and I love how the New Living Translation puts this so practically, when it says, remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. You see, this is a reminder to not only young believers that you should seek out older believers to imitate your life, to grow from, to learn from, and seek guidance from, but it is a reminder to those of us who have been saved, maybe a little bit longer, more seasoned believers, that we always need to be investing in younger generations of people in new believers and new followers of Christ, no matter what stage of life they're in, to help and encourage and assist them in their walk with the Lord and helping them take important next steps. I remember as a middle school boy, a gentleman in our church, his name was Bill. He would pick me up and take me fishing once or twice a week 
while I was off of school in the summer. We would have the best time. He would pick me up early in the morning, and we would go fly fishing in the river near our house. And I remember growing up, I really never had a problem with reading God's Word or studying God's Word. That's always come a little more naturally to me. But I'll tell you, finding a consistent and comfortable uh, time of prayer was something that I was challenged with growing up. I would stand in church and I would listen to people pray these lofty prayers with all of these big words, and they sounded so fantastic. I was so moved by hearing people pray and thinking, you know, I, I can't pray like that. I can't talk like that. I don't, I don't even know what they're saying sometimes. It sounded great, but it didn't resonate with me. So I always felt a little bit less than in my prayers, a little bit distracted and misguided. But I remember Bill just simply praying in front of me. And his prayers were so conversational. They were so real. It was just like a conversation with a friend. He was so natural at it. And he taught me and my younger walk with the Lord just to talk to God. Just to talk to God. You don't have to have all of this big words. Just simply talk with Him. That example in my life helped me become a stronger uh, in my prayer life, stronger in communicating with the Lord. It was, so, it was so needed in my life, and I didn't even know it. We all ne always need to seek people in our life that will help us in our spiritual journey, and we need to be seeking people that we can help. So they follow their spiritual leaders. But Paul is giving this refreshing report. He's saying, you're setting a good example. And he points out, you're setting a good example by the way you are suffering for Christ. In the end of verse 6, Paul writes, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. With joy of the Holy Spirit. Paul is clear. These believers turn from idols to the one and true God, the living Christ. And no doubt, when they made this life change, when they placed their faith in Christ and they turned away from idols, this, this no doubt angered their friends, their relatives. They probably lost their job. They were probably ousted out of the friend circles. They weren't invited to the neighborhood get-togethers anymore. They suffered. And just as the Jewish unbelievers were persecuting the believers back in Judea, these Gentile unbelievers persecuted the Thessalonian believers. And Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 and reminds us, Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. They will suffer persecution. Those that would preach that the Christian life is one free from problems, free from persecution, and only a life full of blessings, wealth, and prosperity, they are preaching a false gospel. While God is good, his, He is rich in mercy and loving kindness, we know that every good and perfect gift comes from our Heavenly Father above. We also know that persecution, suffering, oppression, it is also part of the Christian walk. And when times of difficulty come, we often cry out, Where is He? But it should remind us that we are His. You see, God didn't promise us that fiery darts wouldn't be thrown at us, but God did promise us that He would be our shield. God didn't promise us that storms wouldn't come into our life, but God did promise that He would be our shield shelter. God didn't promise that we would suffer loss, but God did promise a glad reunion day. God didn't promise unlimited wealth and prosperity, but God did promise that he would supply perfect provision. God didn't promise that we wouldn't go through the fire, but God did promise he would be with us every step of the way. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Don't be discouraged when you suffer for Christ's sake. Keep serving. God is with you. Paul also tells these Thessalonians about their good example that they were setting. 
he reminded them that they were encouraging other churches. And in verse 7 of 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul writes, So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. While they were new to their faith, while the church was a new church, they were setting a good example that encouraged surrounding churches and other believers. And that is a great reminder that we should always seek to set a great example and encourage other believers and other churches of God's people to do His work for His glory. They were not in competition. They were in cooperation for the gospel's sake. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 reminds us, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. They were motivated by faith in Jesus, hope of his return, and love for God and other believers. They were setting a good example. But next I want us to see they were enthusiastic for the work. They were enthusiastic for the work. In verse number 8, Paul writes, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Those believers that received the word then in turn transmitted the word. They had received the gospel message. Now they were sharing the gospel message. They took in and then they went out. You know, that is a reminder, a very practical reminder to all of us that have received the gospel message and are walking with the Lord. We need to be enthusiastic about sharing the message, being a witness. You know, Jesus gave us the great commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. For lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But not only do we have a great commission to go and make disciples, but in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we're given an imperative an imperative. In Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is an imperative. This is a muscle. You will be my witnesses. The mark of a believer is you will be my witness. Carl Henry said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. We must be enthusiastic about the work so that we are ready to share the message, willing and ready. You know, it's been said regarding evangelism that evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where they can find the bread. How can we keep this gospel to ourselves? How can we keep it to ourselves? You know, we, sometimes we think that sharing the gospel is preaching sermons or needing to be theologically trained. And all of that is great. Uh, sometimes we, we have the misnomer that it's witnessing is just reserved for pastors or those ordained into gospel ministry. No, it is real people, just like these Thessalonians, real people living real lives, changed by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, turning from an old life to a new life in Christ, and telling others that is, there is hope for their story, hope for their life found in the person of Jesus Christ. Gospel conversations are simply those conversations weaving your God story into everyday life. Kindness, asking about someone's children, praying for needs that you may know are in someone's life, just weaving in the gospel into everyday life conversations, sharing the good news. These Thessalonians were setting a good example by how they had received the word, how they were enduring the suffering, how they were being an example to other churches, being encouraging in their work, and we see that they were enthusiastic for how they were serving the Lord. You know, it is, it is difficult sometimes the older we get, the longer we are believers, the more seasoned we get in our faith. Sometimes it, it, it's as though our, the fire diminishes. We're not as excited as we once were. Oh, I can tell you, 
when you're getting a little maybe cold in your relationship with the Lord, when things aren't just as fresh as they once were, you may not be as enthusiastic as the, as the day you first trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Share the gospel. When the Lord allows you to help someone take their step into eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ, it is like the lights turn on in your system. You get a taste of what you once experienced when you were first saved. It ignites your life and you will be enthusiastic about what God is doing in someone's life. Serve the Lord with enthusiasm because of how he has saved and changed us. But third tonight, they were setting an example. They were enthusiastic about the work, but they were anticipating Christ's return. They were anticipating Christ's return. In verse number 10, we see, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. These Thessalonians were expectant people. They were looking for the return of Christ. They were hopeful and they were patient in their waiting, according to verse 3. You see, they had once worshipped idols, but they had turned from them and found life in Jesus. They had traded a life of no hope for living hope. And you see, the devil and the world lies to us. They present great counterfeits. They present uh, wonderful, alluring counterfeits to the true gospel. But trust me, all of their roads lead to dead ends, to hopelessness, despair, and to death. But when you place your faith in the true and the living God and begin a personal daily relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, everything changes. The psalmist writes about the old life, a life of idolatry, in Psalm 115, verses 2 through 8. Two through eight. Let's see what, what the psalmist says. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Watch this. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. What a great analogy. What a great setup for what it's like to worship an idol. Idols are dead. And so is the life apart from Jesus Christ. It's a dead life. It is a life of no purpose. But these Thessalonian believers, had, they, they longed to see this living Savior that they trusted in. They had turned from a life of worshiping idols, a life of hopelessness, a life of a dead God, and they had found a living, risen Savior to worship. They were new, uh, new in their walk with Christ. They had tasted the freedom of salvation, and they longed to see their Savior. You see, living with expectation of the Lord's re return will help us remain in victory and not in defeat. Life is difficult. The culture is messed up. Inflation, job loss, the political squabble, violence, death, defeatism, division. If you dwell on all of that, if you keep your television locked in on a news station, whichever one you want to, it doesn't matter. If you constantly listen to all of the stuff that's going on in our world, you can be bound up in fear, anxiety, despair, and defeatism, but not for the believer who is anticipating the return of Jesus Christ. Because for those of us who are saved, we know that victory is ours. The battle is finished, the war is over, and victory belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God's people, the church of the living God. We can hold our heads high in victory knowing confidently we are on the victorious side. So anticipating Christ's return helps us amid the persecution and challenges of life, but it also motivates us to win souls. 
in the light of the Lord's coming. We want our family members to be saved. We want our friends to be saved. We want our neighbors and our co-workers, those that are dear to us, we want them to be saved. You know, we can get dazed by the glitz of this life and forget that we are only passing through. You know, it's not about what we get and how much we acquire, how much we store up. The question really is, who is coming with us? Who are we bringing with us? You see, anticipating the Lord's return, it helps build endurance through the midst of life storms. It develops our character while we wait. Strength rises to those who wait on the Lord. It strengthens us in our weakness. It softens our grief. It heals our hurting hearts. It dries our tear-filled eyes. The Lord is coming. And when we dwell on it, we find hope to face the challenges of our life. These Thessalonians were being encouraged by this refreshing report and friend, tonight I pray that you all are encouraged by their example that they set, by their enthusiasm about the work, by their anticipation of the Lord's return. You can't help but read what Paul said about these Thessalonians say, oh, say that about me. You know, we have so much to live for. We have so much to look forward to because of the Lord's coming. One day, we're going to trade gravel roads for golden streets. We're going to trade chain link fence for pearly gates, plaster walls for jasper walls, modest homes for heavenly mansions. We're going to exchange endless worry for everlasting worship, sad farewells to eternal life without end. We're going to take off mortality and put on immortality. We are going to trade all we know in this life for life without end with our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Receive this refreshing word of encouragement. Our daughter Morgan is going to be turning 11 years old in just a week. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. All of our girls are getting older. 11 years old. When Morgan was a baby, we nicknamed her a little monkey because she would climb out of everything. She would climb out of her crib. She would climb out of her pack and play. She was always on the move, always on the move and always getting into things. Always, no matter what it was, markers, crayons, Play-Doh, glue, you name it, she got into it. We called her a little monkey. Morgan is the sweet tender, passive daughter. She's not aggressive. If you get on to her, she's all, she'll always crumble up and cry. She's very sensitive, very soft. Sweet, sweet Morgan. Well, when Morgan was just a toddler, right before she turned three, but she was still two years old, Morgan was notorious for getting into anything. And one day, Morgan got into a jar of peanut butter. She had it all over her little arms, all over her hands, all over her face, in her hair. She had smeared peanut butter all over the glass table. Some was on the door, some was on the blind, some was on the wall, some was on the floor, others, other of it was on the chair. She had wiped peanut butter like a grand art artistic masterpiece all over our kitchen i had a mild meltdown it took a long time to clean up morgan and an even longer time to clean up the house peanut butter sticks everywhere and everything it touches it attracts in that peanut butter, there was glitter and, and construction paper and crumbs and hair. All kinds of things was stuck in that mess of peanut butter. And I read this quote. Encouragement is like peanut butter. The more you spread it around, the better things stick together. Isn't that true? Paul's encouragement to the Thessalonians 
it would help stick them together to navigate the persecution they were facing, to open their hearts, to receive Paul's message, to equip them with further teaching and further instruction while he gave them this refreshing report. And my prayer for you tonight is that the Lord would encourage your heart, that he would encourage your life to be an example, to be enthusiastic about his work, to be anticipating his return, that you would be encouraged so that it would help us as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to stick together. You know, the world, they seek to attack us. Satan seeks to devour us. Life's storms discourage us. The busyness of our day, they distract us. But my prayer for you tonight is be encouraged so that together we can stick together making much of Jesus, living ready for his return, and enduring the storms that face the life of the believer. I love the song, the little chorus that we sang years ago, we'll work till Jesus comes. And that is my prayer to encourage us tonight. Let's work till Jesus comes. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the refreshing report that you gave these Thessalonian Christians from the words of the Apostle Paul. And I pray tonight that we'll be challenged that just as Paul reviewed their lives and their early days as Christians and a church, that, Lord, as you review our lives, you will find us being an example to other believers, being enthusiastic about your work, and, Lord, living ready for your return. We love you, Lord Jesus. And I pray that if there's anyone listening tonight or watching this broadcast that has never trusted you as their Savior, that before the night is over, they will call on the name of the Lord and be saved. How we love you, Lord Jesus. May you find us faithful until you call us home or you return to take all of us to glory to be with you. We love you. We thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.